Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Riley, and I'll be hosting uh, this webinar for you today. Before we get started, um, if you can just turn off your notification settings, um, which will disable any pop-ups or sounds that come through. So if you can do that now, um, if you just go to the settings um, and untick all the boxes underneath notification settings, you won't receive any um, pop-ups or sounds during today's webinar. Okay. Um, so today's technical topic is uh, data-centric evolving power grids. Um, and this one is being presented by Professor Akhtar Kalam, who is uh, the, deputy chair, the deputy chair of um, our academic board at EIT. And everyone will receive a copy of the, um, the slides and a link to the video recording of this webinar via email. We also provide a digital certificate of attendance um, for live attendees. Um, and there will be a link to a short form at the end of this session, uh, which you can complete um, in order to get one if you would like to. Okay, so just briefly about EIT, we're in a specialist engineering college. Um, we deliver a range of courses from short courses to uh, diplomas and advanced diplomas to uh, undergraduate, graduate certificates, bachelor's and master's degrees, and a doctor of engineering. We have industry oriented programs, so all of our programs are regularly reviewed and updated to stay uh, relevant with the uh, industry developments. We also have our vocational programs and higher education degrees registered and accredited by the Australian government, and we have a, a range of um, courses that are now internationally recognised under the three international engineering accords. Uh, we have industry experienced lecturers and we also have um, a unique delivery model uh, which includes the use of uh, live and interactive webinars such as the one you're in today um, and dedicated learning support as well as uh, the state-of-the-art technologies such as hands-on workshops, remote laboratories and simulation software. hand over now to uh, Professor Akhtar Kalam, who will be presenting this uh, topic for you today. You might be uh, muted, uh, Akhtar. Uh, good day to all of you, and thank you very much, Riley, for the kind start and, and um, very valuable one. Uh, I think uh, you are a better speaker than I am, Riley. So, but anyway, I'll try to compete with you. Um, my topic today is something new that I have worked out. And, and I'm going to talk about um, a data centric uh, grid. Uh, the, but before that, a br brief introduction about myself. Um, as you can understand, that uh, I've had. Um, a substantial amount of uh, teaching experience, uh, teaching research and consultancy work. And I do that uh, throughout the world. Uh, currently, I have supervised about 50 PhD and master's students, uh, 38 of them on PhD and 12 masters. Uh, currently, I've got 12 of them that I'm still working with. Um, I'm a very active consultant and um, I look at uh, various aspects of energy as, as, and in particular change management. Graduate of um, uh, two Indian institutions and then um, did my master's in, in Oklahoma and, and my PhD in Bath. A uh, fellow of many um, organizations uh, as well as chartered engineer in many of these so-called English-speaking world. Now, uh, coming to my presentation, and, and this is the presentation agenda that I have. And the first agenda that I have is drivers for change. 
And uh, I want to start with that. Why do we want to look at such type of drivers, especially on the design and operation of electrical power systems? And I have to tell you that this COP27, which has taken place, has been a very important and educated experience for everyone. We need to work with each other. We need to advance our work on climate change. Climate change is becoming a very big issue. And I can tell you right now, the practices that we have had till now is really not suitable and conducive to the climate that we are in today. And, and I can assure you, uh, there are some people having problems with the with the speakers, Riley. Can you hear me all right, Riley? I am, right. uh, yes, oh, the, the sound is fine. So the good. sound is fine, because someone wrote that um, they can't hear me. Uh, uh, but Ray has just confirmed that he can hear us. Anyway, um, thank you very much, Ray. Now, um, I think together we can make a, a complete change. And uh, one thing which has become very important is data. Data is now king. Everywhere you will find data. And you will find, and I want to put it right in the beginning, that our jobs, which was confined to engineers, and in particular electrical engineers, you might find a lot of competition because you will find a lot of people coming from IT areas, from computing areas, from mathematics areas, from psychological areas, from physiological area, you name it, and you will have a lot of people coming. But there'll be a huge amount of job, and there will be a huge amount of job for everyone. So I did say that um, there will be great impact, and one of the greatest impact will be in energy. And uh, energy, uh, we have to coordinate the introduction of what I call smart energy, and that's what I would be doing towards the end of my presentation today. Uh, this smart technology will have legacy grids, which were not accommodate, which was not designed to accom accommodate such type of things. We need to prioritize standards relating to smart energy. We need to combine technical and policy expertise so that we can advance these technical standards. Other areas that is very important these days is hydrogen, circular economy, and ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance. So this is a, one of the biggest drivers that is trying to tell me that let us talk about something quite out of the uh, textbook type of presentation that many of my colleagues give. And let us talk about the real problem. So I will be talking about the challenges which is facing the designers and operators of net zero power systems so that there is systems of resilience and the challenges that is faced by the smart grid. And, and then there will be a, a summary or conclusion. So the first thing that I want to say is that the grid is ever evolving, my friend. The grid is evolving because we do not have at the moment a traditional corporate type of structure that we used to have where there were state electricity commissions. We now have a completely liberalized market so there's been a complete shift in the way the electricity supply industry is operating now with the privatization in full swing. Then there is a increased cross border bulk power transfers. And, and that is a, a very big thing that is, uh, to give you example in Australia, Victoria is selling big power to South Australia. Queensland is selling to uh, South Australia. So even if they have all these wonderful renewables, they require huge amount of power from other institutions. 
So this market is evolving. This market is going bigger. Now, the other thing which is becoming very important is we are seeing a lot of generation technologies. We are seeing a lot of storage technologies. And you'd be surprised, we are looking at power electronics, which are interface and which is not visible to system operator that is less than 100 mega, megawatt. So this is invisible to the SOs, which is the system operators. So you find everyone is talking about renewables. We are saying uh, in Australia, we are saying that um, by 2030, we will have 100% renewables. So we will no longer have the traditional coal-fired plant at the moment or till recently, till four or five years back, 78% of the energy that used to come in our grid used to come from fossil fuel plant. And we're going to reduce that to zero. So you find a lot of onshore and offshore wind farms. You're finding a lot of large PV, concentrated PV. And you're finding now storage coming in big ways. You find batteries, 300 megawatt batteries, 400 megawatt batteries coming at the backup supply. And most of these especially the wind and the solar, they are stochastic and intermittent. Can we depend on that completely? That is the big question. Then there is the small scale one, which is widely dispersed technologies, which is used in the distribution network. So we've got, we've got all these wonderful things coming up. You find that these, Devices that I have, I'm talking about, you find that uh, these are proliferating the, the power electronic based transmission facilitating technologies. So you're seeing a lot of HVDC line. You will see LCC, which is line commutated converter. You're seeing predominantly VSC, which is voltage source converter. And you are seeing MMC technology, which is modular, multi-level converter technology. And these all mesh together. And this is what we have as a super grid. So you find that um, there is an increased penetration of both the static and active shunt and series compensation. This huge amount of deployment of fax devices faxes flexible AC transmission system. So you are looking at new types and operational patterns of load. The new types of load within the customer premises, example, the heat pumps, the power electronics loads, the lighting. This is, there are some of them that is controllable, but the worst thing is still to come and that is electric vehicles you find that this is going to become a big issue, especially with the uncertainty of spatial and temporal uncertainty. That means the spatial is the lack or the error in the knowledge about the geographic position and temporal is the level of prior knowledge and information regarding the duration of the specific event. So this is the grid that we have. And sorry, this is the grid that we are working to. So it's going to become very, very difficult. And you find that um, this one, the grid is evolving in such a way that you need to have energy and information security of integrated systems. And therefore, you need an integrated approach. So there could be integrated ICT, which is information extraction. That itself is a challenge. You need integrated intelligent power electronic devices, which is bi-directional, so it's no longer monodirectional. So if, I'll show you that how the power system was before. Now you can, you can be swapping the power system from one side to the other. And there are all sorts of different energy carriers. And another big issue has come, cybersecurity. This has made life very difficult 
my friend, this has made life very, very difficult. So with that start, let me talk about the integrated systems. Do you see that uh, this is what we had before, the electrical power network. Then about five to 10 years back, we talk about the comms. Now we are looking at gas network. So look at how much the whole system, the whole system has become integrated, not only electrical, but the comms as well as the gas. So you find that you might find, you might find a situation when you might have a whole smart city or network. Look at this network, very complicated network. And that is the type of thing. All the city will be smart, the network will be smart, and the building will be smart. And that is how the things are pushing. So a stage is coming, my friends. A stage is coming, my friends, when we have to look at the ID of the future power and energy network. As I told you, the market is evolving. New structures are there. New operations are there. The power flow is no longer predictable. It is variable. And you've got a, a uncertain, an uncertain technology, a completely uncertain technology. Your generation, your storage, all that has become P connected. That is power electronics. So power electronics itself is basically a transmission facility technology. And towards the end, I will show you, I have built a lab, I built a substation, which is a $3.5 million worth of substation. It's a 66 to 22 kV in my university. And I was very proud of that. It took me 10 years to build that lab, and I'll show it to you towards the end. And I've been working for Americans at the moment and doing a lot of consultants to work for them. And now they've asked me to build another lab and remove all the IDs that I have, which is digital IDs, and to make it all into power electronics base. And I will talk about that. And this is the thing that will happen in the next 25 years. So I'm not going to talk only about today, but I'm talking about 25 years from today. What will happen to your substation? So you will find that the whole situation, especially with the power electronic based society that we are in, there is a lot of varying and uncertain load. And you have got a lot of data. This huge amount of data we have. And therefore, we have a huge amount of energy and information security, which is becoming an issue. And unless and until we solve them, we will find that we are no longer in the picture. So you can see, with this uncertainty, I don't think, and the data that we have, I don't think a traditional electrical engineer can solve these problems. I think a stage will come then we need help from the IT people, from the mathematicians, from other areas. So you will find at the moment in the electrical area, a lot of people from electronics and communications came in, but now we are going to have others also coming in. So they will find the grid to be home of many specialists. It won't be purely electrical engineers. And as I told right in the beginning, data will be king. So let us see what are the threats and, and what, what can go wrong. I mean, anything can go wrong. Let us see what, what, what we have done. Okay. The first thing is that in the olden days, we used to talk about technical faults and accidents, isn't it? We said that um, there was a fall, there was a single line to earth fall, there was a ground fall, there was this fall, there was that fall, there were accidents. Okay. The system is still the same, the faults which were the old ones. Now we are finding with the climate change more frequent extreme weather and natural disasters. With all these renewables, 
And if there is a cyclone and tornado, as it happened in 2016 in South Australia, where all the wind turbines were uprooted and there was no power in West South Australia for 10 days. Um, now, the new thing which is coming, and this is a very difficult one, is the cyber attacks and malicious attack. This is a very difficult type of situation that we are in. We are in a very, very difficult type of situation because it's very hard to predict cyber attacks. And malicious attack has become so common, the spam mails and other things which is there, it becomes so common that it is very difficult to know what is the good mail, what is the bad mail, what is the ugly mail. And sometimes and people like me who have lost their 30, 40 years of work because of these new type of attack, which I was not used to. On the top of this, we have these pandemics. The COVID has come in. And we never expected this, my friend. We never expected this. The work pattern has changed. We are now talking over online. We are teaching online. We are, we, we are, we are looking at all sorts of things, my friend. The so pandemics has taught us good things, but it has also brought in some huge problems. Now, let us look at the resilience. And I told you I will be talking about the resilience. The first thing that I want to talk about is network resilience. That means resilient to future risk. And I'm going to focus on three things the network, the workforce, and the cyber. Okay. So all of us know that network redundancy is an all or not, nothing approach to provide continuous network operation. So when we talk about network resilience, that is a recovery from small system faults on a single network device or between devices without needing duplicate hardware and software. This is a classical thing. Okay, the classical resilience of physical network. Now, the workforce resilience. We're having problems because we do not have the skilled, trained, and content workforce. This is a huge issue that we have now. We cannot get proper type of people because we and those who are the expertise, those who have got expertise, and I give a lot of lot of lectures to the industry, and I talk about six one eight five zero. I talk about smart grid, and they are low to these changes. They say, "Why you are making my life difficult?" Now, the other problem I'm having is cyber. This is my data and ICT network is no longer safe. And I have to provide enough resilience in the system so that I do not have issues with that. So in short, what I have is a power system which is such that it has the ability to withstand disasters. So my system should be resilient. That means it must withstand disasters. That is low frequency, high frequency. Impact disasters, low frequency means if there's low frequency, I need to have long-term monitoring. I have to look at power energy, which is not supplied, look at duration, look at frequency, look at probability. The high impact one, it could be very comprehensive, my friends. It could be economic, it could be social, it could be geographic, it could be health and safety. So I want, if possible, least type of interruption. I want my electricity, but I want least type of, of interruption so that I can sustain a critical social service and enable a quick recovery and restoration to the normal operation state as quick as possible and with minimum cost. And with minimum cost. So, now, the other resilience that I have issues is, is the power system resilience. 
Now, this is the ability to limit the extent of the system impact and duration of degradation in order to sustain critical services, especially after any extraordinary or abnormal situation arises. For this, we have to anticipate, we have to absorb, we have to rapidly recover from, we should have the ability to adapt to and learn from such an event so that if this event occurs again, we will not go through that same stage. These extraordinary events may be due to natural disaster, may be due to some accidents, may be due to equipment failures, or it could be cyber attacks. It could be anything. Now, now I want to go to my next part, which is the challenges. The challenges which is facing the designers and operators. These are the challenges that I'm going to talk about so that we can get system resilience. As I told you right in the beginning, data, my friend, is a king. Data, there is so much data in the system, it is very hard to make out and distinguish between the good, the bad, and ugly data. So I want to make sure that I have got efficient use and reliance on existing and newly acquired data. So I need some sort of measuring device. And naturally, I need two-way communication and a global monitoring system, which is VAMS, so I can do my state estimation. You can also look at static and dynamic equivalence of control, including real-time control. So when we are looking at efficient data management, we will be looking at signal processing, aggregation, transmission, and the ICT network reliability for both static and dynamic observability, as well as the operation and control of the system. So I am not talking about data as information. I'm talking data analytics. I'm talking about data analytics. Now, my second challenge that I have and this is another interesting one. The second challenge that I have is modeling. I need to have accurate modeling, whether it is in the steady state or the dynamic studies that I'm doing. So you understand that this is variable. It could be stochastic. Operating conditions are influenced by market forces. And there is uncertainty in generation and load. I told you right in the beginning, there's uncertainty. I really can't predict well in advance what the load is going to be and how the generation is going to cope up with the load. So we are having a lot of renewable energy storage now, the cluster of them coming up, whether it's in the form of generation or storage. Okay, the same or different types. Some of those are not visible at transmission level. So you find that the demand, including the new type of energy efficient and power electronic control load, the heat pump, the customer participation and behavioral patterns, electric vehicle, this is going to become a big problem for 2030 and 30 onward, because you're going to get rid of all our IC engines and replace it by electric vehicle. So the whole demand pattern will change. You will not have any more the time of use that the luxury that you had, the daytime, the on time, and the off peak time. Because you'll be charging your, your electric vehicle in the night time. So there will be a huge demand, which traditionally has never happened in the off peak time. Now, for auxiliary services, we'll be looking at storage technologies. So this is where batteries come in. Whether your lithium ion batteries will be there or not, that's a different question. I don't believe that lithium ion batteries will be there for a long time. But, um, but whatever it is, you will need some sort of storage technologies. 
and you will have a large interconnected network and there'll be all sorts of generations in there which will be highly stochastic renewable generation again the flexible ac transmission system and short or long distance bulk power transfer and you'll be using hvdc loyal so you're going to be modeling or doing the analysis of a very efficient and effective integration of different energy carriers into self-sufficient energy module or cell. This interconnected critical infrastructure system, I refer to as system of systems. So there are so many uncertainties to justify conventional deterministic models. The probabilistic model has become necessary. Believe me, this has become a necessity now that um, you cannot be dependent on conventional deterministic modeling. You have to look at probabilistic modeling. So another issue has come in. And if you look carefully now, let us go to the third challenge. My third challenge that I have is control. So I had modeling as my second challenge. My third challenge is control. We have got advanced controllers and control structures. Look at a huge amount of uh, network automation that is taking place. So we will need supplementary controllers, especially the VAMs to control and stabilize large systems, which includes real time or parts of it. With uncertain power transfers or, or you parts of it which may vary with uncertainty and load models and stochastically varying and intermittent power electronics, connected generation demand and storage. So you, you have to have a stochastic and probabilistic control of system with reduced inertia. Then the second issue you'll have in control is design of new control system, which will be distributed. It'll be cooperative or hierarchical, adaptive, very, very close to the real system. So this will be a complete integrated sensing ICT technology and protection system. So you would be risking, you'd be risking a limiting control. So you find risk has become a very uncertain event and risk is such is an uncertain condition. And if this is happening, that means it will have its effect on on the probability of something happening multiplied by the resulting cost or benefit if it does. That means the cost is going to escalate. So somehow or the other, I have to do risk, real time risk limiting control. Now, after doing all that, after doing all that, let us identify the challenges. I told you there are three challenges I have. The first challenge was data. The second was modeling. The third was control. So the first challenge I told you was to introduce data analytics. You use that for your planning, operation, and control. So you need new skills of workforce. Okay. So I think uh, people like me will be outdated. Only young people like you will be there. Because you can retrain yourself, you can reskill yourself, you can be employed, and especially you will be coming from non engineering area. So, those who are computer science, mathematics, com, social science, those type of people will now join and they will be your competitor in the workforce. Although the workforce will be much larger, you will not lose your jobs, but you will have additional skills coming from the people who are experts in computer science, maths, comms, and social science. The second thing I told you, the second challenge is modeling. We need to develop appropriate model. And I told you, it can't be conventional one. It has to be probabilistic model. So you need, again, new skill of workforce. Again, you have to have retraining. You have to have reskilling and employment of people from non-engineering background. Again, people from mathematics and social science background will come in to do that. 
And the last thing I told you, the third challenge I had was control. Therefore, now we have got a stochastic distributed control, which is our new control, which is a huge amount of network automation will be there. And that will be giving you a real time risk limiting control of the system. So if you look at the new skills of the workforce, which is required again, you need to retrain, reskill and employ people from non-engineering background. They will come with skills of control, with mathematics, with communication background. So you see, nowhere in that, in those three challenges, I have mentioned electrical engineering. We have to make them understand electrical engineering. That will be the challenge. Now I go to the third thing that I've identified. That is the challenge and smart grid. Challenge and the smart grid. Let us see that. This is how the grid is. This is how the grid is today. This is traditional grid. Look at the grid flow. Look at the power flow. It's centralized. One direction only. Look, from here is going down. Generation is following the load. Depending on the load, that's how the generation is. So there is a limit, limited grid accessibility for any new products. Whereas the future grid, look at the future grid. It is not only centralized, but also there is distributed. Now I have added a lot of renewables. It's no longer the traditional fossil fuel plant. I've got a lot of renewables in there. So, and then the renewables are intermittent. I've told you, you can't be 100% dependent on it. Today you have sunshine, tomorrow you might not. Today you've got wind, tomorrow you may not. And you have got 100% dependent on these intermittent supplies. <coughs> now what will happen? that you no longer are consumers you're also producers you've got excess energy you sell it back to the grid which is a feed-in tariff that is already there but after a period of time your feed-in tariff will be zero dollars at the moment is reduced substantially but after a period of time there's no fun selling it back to the grid why don't i sell it to my neighbor so i am no longer a consumer but I have got a new term for them. I call it presumers, prosumers, P-R-O-S-U-M-E-R-S. -E and look at the flow. Look at this. This was monodirectional, one direction. Look at the flow. Flow is multidirectional. And load is adapted to protect production. And the operation is based now, and the operation is based now on real-time data. Now, people ask me this question, and I, I, I laugh at that. I think everyone is talking about smart grid. I've heard the US president talking about it, the European Commission, all the political leaders talking about it. Smart grid is a political target. Everyone in the government, depend, departments, parliaments, regulators, everyone is talking about it. See, you're looking at the legal framework where all the utility CEOs are involved, the boards are involved, all the investment is there, and they have to produce the technical solutions. Now, looking at that figure, you do not know where we are. Where are we? We, the ordinary people, we, the ordinary consumers, where are we? This is where we are. We are the voters, remember? And if you are voters, you can kick these guys out. So you have a say too. So there are many players now in the smart grid area. So my portfolio, when I look at that, if I look at my portfolio carefully, I will find that my portfolio now has got protect production, which could be traditional power plant, which I think will disappear in, they say, 2035. I don't think it will disappear completely, but say, let us say, let us take what the government is talking about today. Okay, if that will disappear, you will have solar, wind, all sorts of distribution generation. And the consumption could be by smart meters, by smart houses, plug-in vehicles, electric vehicle, and the industry. So you will have real-time pricing and control centers. You'll be using a lot of VAMs. 
you'll be considering wind and solar integration. Now you'll be looking at substation and feeder automation. And I will be showing you how I am doing my substation automation. And then the utility comm system, that is PLCs, the optical fiber and wireless communication. You'll be looking more and more in, in fax devices. Then you'll be looking at uh, the voltage source converters, especially the HVDC system uses VSC technology, such as the one which ABB uses, which is the HVDC light. They use that, that is an ABB product. Okay, this is becoming very, very prevalent, especially at a power rating up to 1000 megawatt. Then there is HVDC classic, HVDC classic which is line commutated converters, LCC, HVDC. Then Hitachi has branded is high performance static compensators, okay, which is statcoms, which has the concept of SVC light and the static wire compensators. So you find there are a lot of integration of wind and solar power. Electric vehicles are going to be there. You'll be requiring a lot of charging station which has to look at the demand response and comps. So there'll be smart meters, which will demand response and improve outage management, network planning, quality man monitoring, et cetera. And your energy management system will be requiring again demand response. And you will have houses, which will be very smart. So you have seen this layer. This is what we have always seen. The generation, there's transmission, there's a distribution system. Now we've got all smart meters. You have the home area network, building area network, industry area network, and these are all the rechargeables that the microgrids and all the electric vehicles. This is what we have up till now. Now a new layer has come in, the commerce, where all the LAN enterprise is there, the van is there, the NAN is there, the fan is there, new type of AMIs are there, and again, the same thought of, of uh, home area network, building area network, industry area network. So this is the new layer. Look at this layer is as great as that layer. So now someone might ask me, someone might ask me that, uh, look, um, what is the hurdle? Everyone faces this problem. First hurdle is the regulatory system. And that regulatory system many times discourages adoption of new technologies. The second hurdle I think is the disincentive. If you put in um, uh, a new system, you will find that you'll be heavily penalized. And the most important thing for us is that we should be able to train people in the new grid technology. So that utility workforce, which is unbalanced at the moment with not a lot of new people coming in, they will be the one who would be trained with the new grid technology, who would have no issues in this at all. So what is the vision that I have? So you will have a new intelligent energy technologies, just like computers and communication devices. This will make our energy system smart. And there'll be energy efficient, environmentally friendly process. And it, they will be the active participant in this process. So when I look at the future, this is what was said by someone from Gateway Computers who said that, uh, look, uh, and this was said as a joke, and I don't know whether it was a joke or a fact, but he gave a deal. He said, look, customers, we'll give you a house, a free house, but we want your utility bill, your internet access, and your telephone services for the rest of your life and your children's life. We'll give you a free house. And that's what is going to happen. Now, the reality will be that um, your refrigerator itself, your humble refrigerator will be on the internet. You will have power sales by appliances. You will have island of automation. You'll be using granular energy management. There'll be diagnostic, like your fridge will tell you there's no cheese, there's no egg, there is no butter. And 
they will understand your behavior very well. And there'll be a lot of co-marketing. So what are the technologies which are available? And, and that, is, that is an interesting thing, the technologies which are there. So we are looking at a whole recombination of, of the market situation. And this can have, uh, this can have a, a completely interesting of effect. Supposing a creative company bought the rights to energy management system in a large number of buildings in a major city, bought in several micro turbines and fuel cells and then offered internet dispatch to local distribution companies in place of generation asset. This can create a huge amount of market paradigm and we have not seen such type of thing. We've got all these things, the internet, distributed resources, the energy management system. If all of them are combined to one provider, it could be a big issue. Now, uh, if you look carefully, um, reliability is a very big problem especially if there's a major manufacturer and it needs to do economic dispatch problem, okay, new technology in a firm unwilling to suffer an outage and they are not going to pay the premium. The whole, there is volatility in the economic studies. There is available technology, but it must be dependent on the business and customers drivers. Okay, what could you be doing? I mean, there must be something that we can do, and there's something that we can do right. Okay, we can scan and understand the market. We can act, initiate, and try new technologies. We can look at new options. We can build alliances and partnerships. We can leverage your advantage. We can prepare for a disruptive market force. Remember, no need, no need of reinventing the wheel. Look at your partners, look at your companions, look at your neighbors and leverage on that and then go ahead. So if you can close the gaps, especially on technical issues, you will find that very useful. Look at developing and demonstrating advanced systems. There is tendency of many higher education uh, institution to be just doing mat-like type, mat -like type of research, okay? You have to look at new type of things. I think more important than MATLAB is Python these days. Industry is looking for that software. Look at that type. Look at building a, a prototype so that you can compare what results you're getting is right. You can integrate the distributed resources. Close gaps on integration issues, especially for an ethical point of view. And look at community power solutions. Look at how you can join the community together rather than selling it to the grid, I told you, sell it to the community. And one problem that we have is, is policy. The policy and regulations have to be tightened up. So what we want to see is that we want to see a grid which is very smart. And S-M-A-R-T, S stands for signal processing, state estimation, stochastic generation, and self-healing. M is for monitoring, that is utilizing VAMs. It has multi-energy carriers, multi-variable optimization and control, and mixed generation, and is market umbrella enabler. A is for adaptive hierarchical control, augmented or power transfer facts or devices and it's affordable. R is for robust, responsive demand, reliable ICT, renewable energy system, real-time control, and reduce uncertainty. T is for transcontinental, tailored for individuals, tolerant to behavioral pattern, and trade-off analysis. And this grid is going to become smarter because I told you it is non-deterministic and it's very close to the real-time approaches especially when we are looking at system control and operation. So, which includes stochastic, probabilistic, and computer intelligence, which is based model, data handling, and methodologies, and possibility, 
is offered by the state of art VAMs, integrated ICT systems, and intelligent bioelectronic devices. So I tell you, smart grids are prerequisite to reach political target, such as environmental, efficient, and secure. When we are looking at smart grid, this is the evolution of the existing grid. If you think building a smart grid, you'll be able to build it on a green site. No, it won't be a green site. You will have to adapt to the present grid. And there you, you have to build your grid on the top of that. There are many requirements. You'll be looking at increased efficiency, reliability. See, we are looking at outage management, which is based on meter information instead of trouble calls. Again, fact devices and HVDC installation. You will be trying to analyze the full scale integration of renewables and electric cars. So you need new solutions, which will be based on pilot installation for test and demonstration. I use the word, you can't be just dependent on software solutions. You have to build some prototype. So you have to look at electric storage. You have to find the demand response and charging infrastructure, especially with the electric vehicles, replacing all IC engines in 10 to 15 years time. So you need to standardize the, the industry. The smart grid challenges and technologies will be able to attract many young engineers to the power industry. So some of the areas that I think you should watch is data analytics, probabilistic modeling, and real-time risk limiting control. And this is what we have been doing at, in my lab we have, got, uh, we have gone through all these levels, except the process level. Uh, we have built this, all this. We have these goose messages, okay? And all the message, all the protection devices talking, 18 of them are talking to each other. Okay, this is how the whole thing is. Uh, unfortunately, you can't have moving pictures in this, in these presentation. Therefore, you can see that it's all going it's communicating our X protection is by ABB and Y protection is with G. Okay, and all these are the, the, the zone substation that I've got. These are all my IEDs. Look at that, it's either G or ABB. You can see this is all the G and this is all the ABB products. Now, that is, uh, that's a lab that you are seeing. Those are, that, that is a huge room. It's a huge lab. Okay, it doesn't show that much. This is the lab, and and somewhere over here is the monitoring control room. Okay, this is the training simulator. Unfortunately, I can't play that because um, this uh, slide does not do moving pictures. But this is my lab, and I wanted to show you how the whole system works. And that is that was very good, but now. When I showed all these things to the United States, they were very interested. They wanted me to build a lab over there in San Francisco. But now they have come up with a new thing. They said that they want advanced substation. So, which means that they want a substation which has new topologies and a huge enhancement of control of power flow. So the grid can be more reliable, more resilient, more more flexible and more secure. So you can see that they are now talking about solid state power substation. And that's what I'm going to build in the United States. So they're looking at high voltage power electronic converters. So this could be applied in full range of grid applications and configure and enable the economy of scale needed to help accelerate cost reduction and improve reliability. Then what happens? This is the, the solid state power station building blocks. These are the converters. These are the application with substation. Now, I this is at this stage, I am at this stage, which is working up to 34.5 kilovolt, and it gives me active and reactive power control. It talks about voltage phase and frequency control, looks at the hybrid, okay, with multiple ports, looks at cable riding, especially to HVRT and LVRT, 
and it is self secure and internal fault tolerance with local intelligence and built in power system security. This is what is my next stage, which is between 25 to 100, 25 kV to 100 MVA. This is my solid state power station, too. So you will see again this added features will be added in. And my last stage will be for all voltage level, which will build me a completely decoupled asynchronous fractal system, which will have automated recovery and restoration, especially in blackout conditions. So what I'm trying to tell you, I have built this one, now I'm going to build this one, and then this one. This, this is now, in five to 10 years will be this, in 20 years will be this. So my friend, the best thing about the future is that only come one day at a time and we live only today, We're not worried about tomorrow. Thank you very much. Riley, it's all yours. Riley, can you hear me? Hi, Doctor. Yes, sorry, I'm just Riley, to... You didn't go to sleep in my presentation, isn't it? <laughs> no, sorry, I was just trying to get my video on. Thank you very much, Doctor. That was uh that was really good and um I'm sure everyone really appreciated that um so i just wanted to before we wrap up the session today i just wanted to run over a few of our upcoming electrical engineering courses um, as you can see there we've got uh, some short courses which we call uh, professional certificates of competency um, so we have a range of short courses upcoming in electrical power system protection, smart grids, um, big data and analytics in electricity grids. We also have um, a few advanced diplomas uh, in electrical engineering starting on the 3rd of April. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, we also have our postgraduate and undergraduate programs starting around June and July this year. So if you'd like to um, if you'd like to know more information about that, please head to our website and um, our course schedule page is a great um, is a great page to look at if you want to see all of our upcoming courses by uh, by date. And we don't have any uh, upcoming webinars that you can register for at the moment, but uh, we have got a few planned for March, um, and they will be posted uh, very soon. So um, just stay tuned for those and uh, we'll, we'll try and send an email out about those as well but uh, we do post all of our webinars on our events page um, and as well, I think there, was a, there was a very good suggestion and and someone mentioned that um uh, why don't you have a bit of music while they are waiting <laughs> Oh, I thought that was fabulous. Whoever wrote that, um, I really <laughs> like that. And uh, I thought of too, and, and this is wonderful. I thought whoever yeah. thought about that was wonderful. Thank you I very need much. To, um, <laughs> I might need to organize a separate webinar for that. <laughs> um, and as mentioned earlier, we we do provide a, a, a free digital certificate of attendance um, for these webinars. So if you'd like to receive one for today's webinar, you can scan the uh, QR code on the screen if you have your smartphone there. Um, otherwise, I'll put the, uh, the link to the form um, in the chat box now. Um, uh, look, Collins, um, you wanted my, my uh, email address. Uh, my email address is very simple. Um, just send it to Riley and he'll send it to me. Very easy. Isn't that right, Riley? Absolutely. I'll put my, um, I'll put my details up in the next. Uh, yes, yeah, because uh, Collins, uh, you might have difficulty in my name. And um, uh, so it's a lot easy. Riley is a better name than Akhtar Kalam. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll put my uh, details up there. So if anyone wants to email me, you can um, you can email webinars at eit.edu.au on the screen there. Um, so you can email me if if you would like to uh, ask me a question or send or send something to 
uh, after. Um, now, I think we'll just finish off the session with a, uh, a very short uh, Q&A, um, if anyone has any questions. But I'll leave the, uh, the contact details up there in case anyone wants to have those. Um, Arari, uh, thanks, thanks for your suggestion. I'll, I'll note down that, um, that topic for a uh, potential future uh, technical webinar. Thank you. If anyone does, please feel free to use the chat box and we can, we can answer them for you in the next few minutes. But otherwise, thank you for, um, for attending today and we hope to see you again in the future. Riley, can I leave because I've got another seminar to give? <laughs> another two no hours worries. seminar. Uh, <laughs> unless uh, you want me to stay, I can stay another two, three minutes, but... Um, yeah, just in case there's any, uh, just in case there's any technical questions that not, none have come through yet so far, or none that I've seen. Um, let's just wait another minute or so, just see if there's any. It's a good presentation. It was a good attendance, Sir Riley. 120 people plus uh, attended. That is good. Yeah. How many yeah, attended? it's great. Um, I think I think that was about uh, 20 or 30 percent of the registration. So not not too bad. Not too bad. That's generally what we try and try and try to aim for. That kind of percentage. Thanks everyone. Thanks for all your comments. Um, I'm assuming no one has questions uh, so far. So um, if you do have any questions, please uh, please send through an email to me at webinars at eit.edu.au um, if you have a question from myself or actor. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks again, Professor. Um, it was it was a very very good webinar. And, and good to see Darren Kelly and Abdullah Mujahid and others who are my students um, also. I'm, I'm so Absolutely. glad I saw it, yeah, which is fantastic. Great. All right. All the best, Akhtar. Okay. Take care of yourself. Thank you very much. You too. Uh, Dane, um, we do have a range of partial scholarships. You can um, you can view those on our website. Um, I'll just provide you with a link. I'm not sure if we have any uh, specifically for mechanical, but um, uh, but we have a range of scholarships that do apply to multiple courses and fields. But just look at our future student uh, scholarships. Uh, Brian, thank you. Um, everyone will receive a copy of the slides and the uh, video recording. Um, but if you would like, if you would like to um, receive a certificate of attendance for this webinar, please just follow the link that I'm putting in the chat box now.